know, the, the most profound piece of it for me was looking out at the Earth and looking at the Earth's atmosphere. Every astronaut, everybody who's been up into space, they say this, that it changes them and they look at it and they're kind of amazed and, and awestruck by it. natural like almost like we should be doing this <laughs> and I hope that we are one of the first and let's hope that many many more people can do this because this experience you should share with more and more people it's so first paying customer you get, feel like you got your money's worth sir <laughs> for sure, for sure. <laughs> no it was so amazing to see it from above and to move around like yeah I totally agree it feels so natural like almost like we should be doing this. <laughs> and I hope that we are one of the first and let's hope that many, many more people can do this because this experience you should share with more and more people. It's so amazing. And a special congratulations to you on becoming the youngest person to have ever flown in space. Thank you. You brought with you up there the next generation of space explorers, but certainly uh, another flag up there, the Netherlands. Yeah. To everybody out there, the Netherlands. There's the new Dutch flying man. There you go. <laughs> what, Mark, you should say that thing you told me in the car about the G-forces. I thought that was really interesting. Well, I was uh, I was surprised. I mean, they had told us what you know the, what the G-forces would feel like on the way up, and um, you know, again, it's one of those things that you hear about and you anticipate, but. Um, you know, I really feel them on the way up. It was incredibly exhilarating. And then, um, you know, on the way back down, what I had not anticipated. So we hit five Gs briefly on the way back down. Um, and that's, that's a lot of pressure. And unfortunately, during the, um, the, the, uh, the, status, uh, the status check for each, a, each astronaut, by the time they got to astronaut demo, which was the name I was flying under, we were at five Gs. And so they were like, <laughs> astronaut demo, how you doing? I was like, I'm doing okay. <laughs> I had a hard time, had a hard time responding, but uh, I'm not sure what that video footage will look like. Probably not very pretty, but By it was, way, it was so you, exciting. If you haven't figured it out yet, uh, well, w Wally might be the oldest person ever in space, and Oliver the youngest person ever in space. My brother is the funniest person ever in space, uh, for sure. I have b before. I want to do a couple of uh, more things before we maybe go to next questions, which is um, I want to recognize two people who, here in the audience. We are honored today to have uh, Alan Shepard's daughters, Laura and Julie. Could you stand up just briefly so we could say? <laughs> and of course, uh, Alan Shepard was a, a Apollo moonwalker and has a g gigantic list of accomplishments. But for our purposes today, uh, the thing that is most interesting about Alan Shepard is that he is the namesake for this vehicle, New Shepard, and that is because the, pro the mission profile that we did today is very similar to the one that Alan flew when he became the first American in space, uh, I guess 60-ish years ago. So it, that is, uh, we are very honored to have you guys here, and thank you for joining us. It, it, it's incredible. I'm, I, I got some pictures with them backstage, and. I know those are getting blown up big. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, so, and then I have a couple things to show. Let's, uh, can we start? Do you want to talk about the couple of things we flew? Like the, go ahead. Well, we did, um, so we had the opportunity to bring with us, uh, it was actually on loan from uh, the Explorers Club. Uh, we were able to fly with a piece of canvas from the Wright Flyer. 
Um, so the, the plane that the Wright brothers flew, um, we brought a piece of that canvas with us, uh, which was really powerful, as well as um, a bronze uh, medallion uh, that was made from uh, the first uh, hot air balloon flight um, in 1783, which was the first time um, man ever uh, you know, left the earth in controlled flight. So we were very thrilled to be able to bring both of those along with us. Um, and we brought those meeting. precious objects back. Yes, we did. <laughs> and the Explorers Club will be pleased yes, to hear that. Yes, they're very happy about that. And we have um, one more thing, which I would actually just like to show you. If you could, who, who has the goggles, could you please bring them up to me? You will, yeah, would you hold that for me? This is incredible. So, all right, why don't you stand so you can get like a basic test. This, um, we also flew, uh, these are Amelia Earhart's goggles. <laughs> the ones she flew across the Atlantic with solo. Uh, and you can see she put tape over them to kind of make, have less light come in because uh, it was just so bright all the day and she was flying for so long. And they're just, I, I like to think that if Amelia were here, she'd be very, very proud of Wally. <laughs> I just can't, I can't resist doing this. <laughs> so, thank you, Amelia, wherever you are. We hope you're watching all of this. Thank you. Exactly. These are precious, precious cargo. And well, on that note, Wally. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. Oh, please go ahead. Thank you, Lauren, just reminded me. I have one more thing, which is, and Christina, I might need your help on this, but Mom, could you come up for a second? Where's my mom? Okay, you don't have to come up, I can come to you. I have, I wore this, I wore this necklace, I wore this necklace, and it is a uh, Blue Origin feather, and I wore it up into space, and now it's for you. Okay. And now, Wally, last but not least, uh, Amelia Earhart, what a, what a lovely uh, transition. An aviation icon and now an aerospace, a space icon. What was it like? <laughs> Woo! I can't tell you. I had such a good instructor, he took us through everything that we were going to do. So when I went up this morning, the noise wasn't quite as bad. And we went right on up, and I saw darkness. I thought I was going to see the world, but we weren't quite high enough. And I felt great. It, 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 I felt like I was just laying down. I was just laying down, and I was going into space. And I want to thank you, sweetheart, because you made it possible for me. I've been waiting a long time <laughs> to finally get it up there, and I've done a lot of astronaut training through the world, Russia, America, and I could always beat the guys on what they were doing because I was always stronger and I've always done everything on my own. And I didn't do dolls, I did outside stuff. And I, and I flew airplanes, I had 19,000 some hours. I loved it and I loved being here with all of you and the, your family and the four, the four of us. It, we had a great time. It was it was That's wonderful. True. I want to go again fast. <laughs> <laughs> and then, when I got off the ship, they gave me the tail end of one of the balloons, and I'm going to cherish that forever. <laughs> uh, and by the way, we can confirm that Wally once again in training outperformed the men on the mission. A hundred percent. I was going to say, she beat all the, the, the three boys up to the top of the crew access tower. <laughs> Everybody saw that. There's video footage. We have proof. Indeed, darling, you did. You did. Well, so Wally Funk, now the world's uh, oldest astronaut to have ever gone to space and perhaps the first founding member of our Blue Origin uh, Frequent Flyer program. <laughs> <laughs> 
And Sounds like I she's ready say, for it. <laughs> when I do lectures or wherever I am around the world in the United States, I'm only 45. <laughs> <laughs> you're being generous. I keep saying everybody, every time somebody says, oh, she's 82, I think there's a typo. She, you're 28, Wally. We know this. Well, no, well, thank you so much for, for giving us your impressions, but let's see it with our own eyes. I'd like to roll the tape of what it was like in the crew <laughs> house. <laughs> That's incredible. Oh, wow. To space. Oh, oh. Is it everything you thought it would be? Here, look. <laughs> Oliver. Move your head just a oh, little. Oh, that's great. Can you move your head a little while it's Oh, fast? yeah. <laughs> I'm off. I love it. Oh, wow, wow, wow. <laughs> look at the blackness of space. Everything. Oh. <laughs> Here, catch. Oh, yeah. oh, yeah. Think we balls. Ready? Woohoo! Here it comes. <laughs> yeah, you just have to wait for it. Who wants a skittle? Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, Turn one. Here with your arm. I'm going to pull you down. No. All right, see if you can catch this in your mouth. Waste? Yeah! Well done! <laughs> Here, toss me one. Let me try. Yeah. Here it goes. Oh, sorry. Mid, 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 Here, try again. I can't get it up. I got you, I got you, I got you. Oh, wow. No, 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 awesome. no, 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 no,
Yeah, I think that our uh, our family has been extremely supportive through all of this, and I think that um, you know, there. Uh, I know that my wife was an absolute rock leading up to this, um, which made um, you know the adventure uh, much easier for me. But I know that uh, when we came down, it was sort of uh, time to let those emotions out a little bit. So uh, it was it was great to see everybody, and yeah, it was a little more emotional than I had anticipated as well. Jeff. Yeah, I mean, um, you know, for I wasn't that nervous, but my family was somewhat anxious about this, and uh, so <laughs> it was it was so sweet actually when to get hugged by them after landing, and especially my kids and Lauren and my mom and dad and really all of you guys and you know we have a bunch of close friends here too and uh, it just makes me realize how much I love you and how much I'm loved. And Wally, your friend Mary is here. Yes, I am so happy she's here. She knows what I'm going through. She's been, uh, she was one of my flight students. And I've had many, many, over uh, 3,000 flight students. And I don't know if they're going to get to see this or not. But I felt so charged. I was not nervous. I was, I was just normal, normal person <laughs> going up into space. And that's what I wanted to feel. Nothing here. I can confirm that while well, I was never nervous. <laughs> <laughs> she, was, she was wondering what was taking so long. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it's true. We had a six-minute hold on the pad. And while well, I was like, are we going to go or not? <laughs> what the hell? We're burning daylight. Let's go. <laughs> But then, Wally, once we got you going, we got you going fast, going over Mach 3. And it's this beautiful rocket behind us here, our New Shepard rocket that got the team up to space. And by the way, it also, of course, made its, uh, its landing back on the landing pad. Why don't we take a look at that, uh, that landing that we have here? That was a bullseye. <laughs> Very cool. Absolutely bullseye. Jeff, a beautiful piece of engineering that our team here at Blue Origin has developed. Would you like to talk to us a little bit, a, a bit about why we chose vertical takeoff, vertical landing, yeah. being powered by this BE3 engine? Yeah. Because today is not the end, right? Yeah. We're going further with this technology. No, that's a, a, a helpful question because um, the fact of the matter is that the architecture and the technology we have chosen is complete overkill for a suborbital tourism mission. Um, we have chosen the vertical landing architecture. Why do we do that? Because it scales. It's an architecture that can grow to very large size. And so we want to have, ex we want to have experience with architectures that can grow big to, uh, to New Glenn and one day to New Armstrong. So to have the idea that you want to build big from the beginning lets you choose an architecture, because the whole point of doing this is to get practice. Uh, uh, and uh, other kinds of architectures don't scale uh, in the same way to, large, to very large size. Vertical landing does. In fact, you can think about it very easily, because if you try to, when you are landing a rocket vertically, you are solving what's called the inverted pendulum problem. And you are balancing a broomstick on the tip of your finger. And you can balance a broomstick on the tip of your finger. You know what you cannot balance on the tip of your finger? A pencil. So basically, the smaller the object, the harder it is to balance. As the object gets bigger and bigger and bigger, it gets easier and easier and easier to balance. It's very simple because it just has more, more, um, more, more momentum. So it's easier to get under it. So that architecture scales. That's why we chose it. And then the second thing that is a very puzzling architecture choice for most people who know a lot about rockets, you would never choose liquid hydrogen for a suborbital tourism mission. It's completely unnecessary. It's the most powerful, highest performing rocket fuel in the world. And uh, there are two reasons we chose it. The first is, again, practice. We chose that propellant because it's the, it is, what you see behind me is basically the second stage of New Glenn. And so every time we fly this tourism mission, we're practicing flying the second stage of New Glenn. And that's where you really do want hydrogen. 
on the second stage of a, of, a, of a vehicle that is designed not only to go into low Earth orbit, but to bodies outside of low Earth orbit. And then the other reason we chose it is because it is the most environmentally benign propellant you can choose. The, uh, when you burn hydrogen and oxygen, you get H2O. H2O is water. And it's, so that is another thing. For a tourism mission, that was really important to us as well. So uh, that's why we chose this architecture you see behind me, and um, the engineering team did an incredible job. They also really built two vehicles. Uh, what you see is not really a vehicle, because I can assure you the escape system was at least as complicated, hard to design, and to test and demonstrate as the main booster itself. Uh, so that was, it's almost like building a whole separate vehicle. And I'm also extremely happy we didn't test it today. <laughs> Thank you so much. Again, congratulations to you all. With that, I'm going to turn it over to Linda Mills, Head of Communications here at Blue Origin, to start the press conference. Thank you very much. Woo! Let's give another round of applause to our amazing, newly minted astronauts. All right. I would like to give a thank you to our journalists who showed up at 2.30 this morning to get set up. I know it's thank been a you. long day for all of you, so thank I, I you. I can't believe you guys are still smiling. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> thank you. So we'll be able to take a few questions, and then we'll um, have to pose for a few photos. So, Rachel, why don't you start? Rachel with CNN. Yeah, Rachel Crane with CNN. Congratulations, you guys, on your astronaut wing. Thank you, Rachel. Yes, so I'm going to split my time between uh, Blue Origin and the Bezos Earth Fund. So the Bezos Earth Fund is about uh, climate change and sustainability, and that is uh, those two things. And there's going to be a third thing um, and maybe a fourth thing, but I don't know what those are yet. I'm not very good at doing one thing. Are you going to be flying again soon? I, it's a, hell yes. <laughs> like, how fast can you refuel that thing? Let's go. All right, next question. Uh, let's go... Uh, Reuters. So Eric asked about the cadence and the capabilities. Okay, uh, we're going to fly uh, uh, human missions twice more this year and what we do in the following year i'm not sure yet We're, we we'll, we'll figure that out and what the cadence will eventually be we want the cadence to be very high and one thing we've found out through the auction process and what we've been doing is private sales uh, we're approaching 100 million dollars in private sales already and the demand is very very high so we're going to keep after that um, because we really do want to practice with this vehicle so we're going to have to build more more booster, uh, more boosters, uh, and to fly more frequently, and we're going to be doing that and working on all the operational things we need to do, all the things we learn. What practice does is let you get better, and we want to be able. Right now, you know, uh, we have a mission life. We think sometime be somewhere between 25 and 100 flights for one of these vehicles. We like to make that, you know, cl closer to 100 than to 25, and then once it's close to 100, we'll push it past 100. That's how you get operational usability. You have to remember. Uh, big things start small. I told this crew when we when we got in today and we were sitting there on the pad waiting to lift off. Um, we had time to ourselves, and I, and, and I just said, guys, if you if you if you're willing, if you let me invite you, when we get up there, and after you know there's gonna be all kinds of adrenaline, all kinds of excitement, all kind of novel novelty, but take a minute, take a take 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 a few seconds to look out and calmly think about what we're doing is not only adventure, it is adventure and it is fun, but it's also important because what we're doing is st the first step of something big. And I know what that feels like. I did it three decades ago, almost three decades ago with Amazon. And we are, big things start small. And you, but you can tell, you can tell when you're onto something and this is important. Uh, we're going to build a road to space.
space so that our kids and their kids can build the future. And we need to do that. We need to do that to solve the problems here on Earth. This is not about escaping Earth. Every time I read an article about people wanting to escape Earth, they say, no, 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 no. The whole point is this is the, mo this is the only good planet in this solar system. We've sent robotic probes to all of them. This is the only good one, I promise you. And we have to take care of it. And when, if you go into space and see how fragile it is, you'll want to take care of it even more. Um, and that's what this is about. We have to take, and this is going to take decades, this is a big vision, but big things start small. And this is how it starts. And we are going to build an infrastructure, just like when I started Amazon, I didn't have to build the postal service or Royal Mail or Deutsche Post. There were people, to, there were already gigantic worldwide infrastructure to deliver packages. That infrastructure today is for space just way too expensive and it doesn't work. But if we can practice with this suborbital tourism mission and continue and build bigger and bigger vehicles, timelines on uh, New Armstrong and, and, uh, and so on, I can't, I can't really give you because we don't know. Um, but what I can tell you is we're going to keep working at those things step by step, ferociously. And I want to emphasize the ferociously. All right, we have time for one last question. And Tom Costello with NBC. Tom Costello with NBC News. Congratulations to all of you. Jeff, to follow up on that, on that question and, and your discussion there, how do you make this more reasonable for everyday people who would like to fly? It's pretty steep right now. How do you bring the cost down so that this can be more accessible for everybody? It's a great question. How do you bring the cost down over time so it's more accessible to everyone? You've got to do it the same way we did it with commercial airline travel. You know, we are still, we're not even, we're really almost in the barnstormer phase, right? So this is, these are, you know, biplanes and they're flying into a farmer's field and charging a small pri a, a price to fly people around for a few minutes in the air. That's what we're doing right now. But you know where that barnstorming phase leads? to 787s, and that's what we have to do. All right, let's give a hand. I'm afraid that's all the time we have for questions today. These astronauts have had a very long day. Um, so let's give another round of applause for our astronauts. And then Jeff, I think I have, you had one more thing. Yeah, I, guys, I have, one, I have one more thing. I have a little surprise for you. Um, I am announcing today uh, a new philanthropic initiative, and uh, if you could put the slide up so people can see it. It is called the Courage and Civility Award. It recognizes leaders who aim high and who pursue solutions with courage and who always do so with civility. Well, let me tell you how I feel about this. I feel strongly enough I actually wrote something down. Um, we live in a world where sometimes, instead of disagreeing with someone's ideas, we question their character or their motives. And guess what? After you do that, it's pretty damn hard to work with that person. And really what we should always be doing is questioning ideas. Not the person. Ad hominem attacks have been around a long time, but they don't work and they've been amplified by social media. We need unifiers and not vilifiers. We want people who argue hard and act hard for what they truly believe, but they do that always with civility and never ad hominem attacks. And unfortunately, we live in a world where this is too often not the case. But we do have role models. And this award, do you have another slide here? Go ahead. It's first, wait, I didn't tell you what the award was yet. I thought there was a slide for that. Here's what the award is. You're, you, you see who the first recipient is. But let me tell you what the award is. The Courage and Civility Award is a $100 million award so that the awardee, the recipient, can give $100 million to the charities, the nonprofits of their choice. And these people, these are people who have 
demonstrated courage. By the way, it's easy to be courageous, but also mean. Try being courageous and civil. Try being courageous and a unifier. That's harder and way better and makes the world better. So the, we have two awardees today. They'll each be getting $100 million to direct to the charities of their choice as they see fit. No bureaucracy, no committees. No, they just do what they want. They can give it all to their own charity or they can share the wealth. It's up to them. And the first uh, Courage and Civility Award goes to Van Jones. Van, come on up. Thank you, brother. Um, sometimes dreams come true. Sometimes dreams come true. And, and the headlines around the world should be, you know, anything's possible if you believe. And um, Lauren and Jeff don't do nothing small, man. They don't do anything small. <laughs> They just don't do it. They, they dream big, uh, they love big, and they bet big. And you bet on me, and I appreciate it. And I'm going to tell you, the only thing I worry about when you say courage, I haven't always been courageous, but I know the people who are. And they get up every day on the front lines, grassroots communities. They don't have much, uh, but they're good people, and they fight hard, and they don't have enough support. Can you imagine? Grassroots folks from Appalachia, from the hood, Native American reservations, having enough money to be able to connect with the geniuses that have disrupted the space industry, disrupted uh, taxis and hotels and bookstores, to th start disrupting poverty, to start disrupting pollution, to start disrupting the $90 billion prison industry together. If you take people on the front lines and their wisdom and their genius and their creativity, and you give them a shot, they're not just going to turn around neighborhoods, they're going to turn around this nation. That's what's going to happen. And I appreciate you for lifting the ceiling off of people's dreams. You have lifted the ceilings off of the dreams of humanity today. And that's an important thing. Don't be mad about it. When you see somebody reaching for the heavens, be glad. There's a lot more heaven up there to reach for. And we can do that together. And the last thing I'll say is this. If this small group of people can make miracles happen in outer space, a bigger group of people can make miracles happen down here. And we're going to do it. Thank you very much. Hey, guys, can you roll the little video we put together about Van Jones? Can you roll that little video, please? Short video. Van has been a part of much change. He has birthed a number of different grassroots community organizations. He also helped us bring together climate justice and racial justice and what that meant in particular for low-income communities of color. You can't live in a country where you just have sacrifice zones, whether it's talking about right, South Central right. or Appalachia or the Rust Belt, and no political party stands up for him effectively. He was always so ahead of the curve that a lot of people didn't understand him. So that was always hard to watch because I know his love for people and for justice, it doesn't matter to him what people say. He continues to do the work that needs to be done. I think about what he's done within the criminal justice system, what he's done with making bipartisanship real, not just what think tanks are doing, not researching the idea, not exploring in history how bipartisanship worked. He's been rolling up his sleeves. He's been doing the work in real life. And I know that uh, Van Jones is going to uh, do something amazing with that $100 million. I don't know what yet. I bet he doesn't know what yet. Um, but, I, but it's in your hands, Van Jones. However you're going to do it, it's going to work. Um, we had lunch together uh, a couple weeks ago, and, uh, and he told me that he was just trying to tell me some of his life story, and he mentioned that when he was a young activist, he was angry. Uh, he, had, he was like, there's a big transformation that happened over the years. He said, 
that his, the acronym that he used was RAP, uh, so for reward and punishment. And if the mayor or whoever it was that they were going up against did something they liked, they rewarded them. And if they did something they didn't like, they punished them. And he said, honestly, Jeff, I wasn't very good at the reward part. Um, <laughs> I really focused on the punishment part. And then he changed. I mean, he really, the, the transformation when you hear his story is unbelievable and profound and, and inspiring. Uh, and you can always, and I think about this for myself, you wake up every night when you go to sleep, you get the chance to wake up better tomorrow. Now, we have another awardee. Let's roll that video. Jose Andres calls himself a pilgrim from Spain, a chef who arrived here 20 years ago with just 50 bucks in his pocket but these days, it's hard to call him anything less than an amazing American success story. I know you. His love of his fellow men and women, his love of eating, which he shares with all of us. He is bigger than life, a force of nature, and a real gift. Michelin starred chef who has won James Beard Awards for both Outstanding Chef and Humanitarian of the Year. Jose Andres is turning several of his D.C. and New York City restaurants into community kitchens. He has helped feed those in disaster areas in the U.S. and around the world. Every time I, I meet you, it's because there's a disaster somewhere in the world, and like a superhero of food, you've stepped in to help feed people. He wants to bring people together, and he uses food to do that. Someone who's extremely generous and gives back so much Boom. to people in need without asking anything. Jose, please come on up. <laughs> and he makes a hell of a paella, too, I'll tell you. Um, you know, I'm, I'm so honored, huh? really grateful for, for this award and the incredible support uh, from you, Jeff, and the entire Bessos family. Um, World Central Kitchen um, was born from the simple idea that food has the power to create a better world. A plate of food is a plate of hope. It's the fastest way to rebuild life and communities. And this award itself cannot fit the world on its own. But this is the start of a new chapter for us. It allows us to think beyond the next hurricane to the bigger challenges we face. You know, people of the world, I mean, now, is the time to think really big, to solve hunger with the first urgency of now. You know, the only thing we want to do is revolutionize um, disaster and hunger relief. You know, people don't want our pity. People want our respect. It's the least we can do is be next to them when things get tough. We want to double food aid around the world. And we want to change the way 3 billion people, mainly women, cook their food today, from dirty cook stoves to clean cook stoves. You know, we think globally, but we feed locally. And the pandemic drove tens of millions into hunger and starvation last year, this year. The climate crisis is driving millions more across borders. We can and we must respond together Governments, business, nonprofits, every single citizen. Out of empathy, for sure, but also to keep our world safe, stable, and sustainable. We will be there with our boots on the ground when disaster strikes. But we will also shoot for the stars, Jeff. Fighting hunger and the causes of hunger. Because, you know, whether you are on the ground or on the top of the world, it's obvious that we, the people, we are one people. One planet sharing our daily bread together. I always say that I believe in longer tables, no higher walls. So, you know, Jeff, let's go and let's feed the world. Thank you.
Thank you. Longer and tables Jose, and not higher walls. Uh, that's incredible, Jose. And um, I know I don't know what you're going to do yet, but I know whatever it is, uh, you'll figure something amazing out uh, to do. I know you will. And you're just a, you're just an inspiration, uh, a huge inspiration. Thank you. And um, we're going to take a photo if that's all right. Yeah. I think I know, a lot of our journalists okay. would love to get a photo of the three of you together. <laughs> idea, idea. Perfect. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you all for joining us. This wraps our press conference. I'm going to let Oliver lead our astronauts out and thank, thank you, you guys all. we know it's not easy to get here we know it's well, you put a lot of work into coming to this to this launch and supporting us and I hope you had some fun and I hope that it was inspiring for you as well but uh, and, uh, and no matter what thank you for coming very much appreciate it thank you all right what we're gonna do next is we're gonna have the opportunity for you to get back onto the coaches. We're gonna take some photos at our landing pad. And so there will be some marked areas for you to stand behind. I just ask that you follow our guides to do that. And so media, please exit out the back. Thank you.